Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm here to tell you how to be more comfortable comfortable editing your backend. Uh, first, a little introduction. Uh, my name is Koen Bollen. I'm a backend engineer and in heart a game developer. That's where I come from. Started out teaching and then started a game studio, small one, not a lot of big titles. Um, I've been using Go. I look back in Git history and I found a gist of or gist of 2014 of my first checked in Go program. Um, so I've been using it since 1.4 that was, I believe. Um, and currently I work at Pokey uh, for over oh, four and a half years now, um, which is a web game portal. As you can see here, you go to pokey.com as a kid or a adult kid. You click on any game and you play immediately. There's no install, download. You should play very fast. Um, <clears throat> we don't make the games ourselves. We work with game developers and we supply the users and uh, some revenue in form of ads. Um, we hit about uh, 50 mi million unique users a month last month, which we're very happy with. And we work with around 300 developers on a revenue share basis. We split the revenue 50-50. And about 60 of them make their living purely through the revenue from Pokey, which I'm very happy about. As a game developer myself, I'm super happy with that. And we use a lot of Cucumber testing in all our backends, uh, which are all written in Go, hence I'm here. Um, that's a little about me. And I'm very curious about you guys. Who here is programming in Go? Who here is programming in Rust? Who here in something else? Okay, perfect. Who here makes backend or APIs or services? Perfect. Who here has a very comfortable test suite for their API? Okay, I'm hoping to increase this in, after this and in a couple of months. And my code snippets will mostly in Go, but what I'm going to tell you works in every language, and I've done it in a couple, actually. Um, and we're at the point where I only rely on the test suite. Make a change to the test suite, I change my code, it goes into a review, of course. Then CI runs the test suite completely. And then I, sh I merge it and ship it directly to production. There's not, no manual does it work in between anymore. That's where we're at right now. OK. So for today, uh, we are done with the introduction. I'm going to explain to you uh, what is Cucumber. Then I'll talk about how you test your API in Go generally and how you could do it in Cucumber. Then I have a list of why would you do this, because it sounds like a lot of work. That's what you're going to think first. Um, then I have a demo set up where I'm going to add a feature to one of our backends, which will definitely go wrong, because it's a demo in a public speaking setup. Uh, then a couple of tips and some closing notes. And hopefully, you have a bunch of questions for me, which I expect, because people usually do. OK, let's go. What is cucumber, uh, except for the, the, the vegetable? Um, it's more of a language, of, more of a specification. Um, if you went to the uh, workshop at, about TDD, he used it in his comments, the same kind of style. It is English text, or you can technically do it in any language, but coders like to write in English. Uh, that reads, in this case, it's a very bad example taken from their, their website of Cucumber, which is the format is always you're describing a feature with a title and description, and then a couple of scenarios about the feature. Then there are a couple of sentences that state, given some background state, like given this is in the database. Then an event happens, and then there are some consequences to check. Um, and this is English. It's plain text, a very portable. You can use it for a lot. They aim and say it's a, the overlap of automated testing, living documentation, and what they call an executable specification. Because you can run this as a test, which will become clear in a couple of slides. Uh, I started out, when I first learned this, my previous company was using Ruby, um, which is not great, but it was what it was. Um, and then we started shifting to Golang a lot for the backends and a bit of Python for some data science. And 
what we found is that when we were re rewriting our search service to go, we could reuse our entire test suite, which was super nice. Um, currently, I'm also doing it for client library. I'm using uh, Cucumber in JavaScript. And before coming here, I also did a quick search. And I think their uh, Rust implementation looks pretty nice. But I'm not a very uh, Rust uh, savvy person, so I can't judge it for real. But it looks really nice. OK. Now, a quick rundown on how this is an executable specification. Because how does it actually work? And it's kind of stupid, simple. Each of these steps, these three, um, you make a step definition. What does it do, this step? And it's usually just a regular expression to match it. Uh, in this case, on the top, it says, given Alice is hungry, and the regular expression is, name is hungry. And the library, in this case, it's it to say to go, make sure the name is put in the first argument of the function. And there I set the active person, we're talking about Alice, and I'll initialize it to zero, because they're hungry. I also implement the she eats an X amount of cucumbers, which is just a plus is amount. And then a then step is usually a check. I simply do an if statement, and I return an error. Um, I like to see if you write regular tests, you sometimes write some helper functions to set up create a user, like create test user. Um, in Cucumber test, everything is a helper function. And you can see these step definition as helper functions, with the only exception is that you can write any inline code. More on this, I'll show some actual examples, uh, but this is nice and short. I'll show some actual examples in a, in a couple of next slides. Um, and for Golang, I'm using Godoc. Uh, uh, it's been adopted by the uh, Cucumber Foundation now, and they have the cutest image. Um, <laughs> I needed to include it. Um, the thing is, you can use Cucumber for a lot of different things. Um, a friend of mine who is a product manager at uh, a Dutch retail website, and they use it to give some uh, terms and settings, and that they don't run it. It's just a form of writing their tickets, basically. And this is an example they sent me. Uh, given a contract is created, when the contract is ready to sign, the seller agrees to the terms of condition of this period. This doesn't run anything. This is just a, a, for, a, a formal way of them for them to write stuff. And on the left, I have the simplest example of testing an API for us. That's what I'm going to talk to you about. It. Um, if you look for documentation on Cucumber, this is not what they're shouting about, but this is what I'm shouting about. Um, in this case, it's super simple. Given the client does a get request to this endpoint, the health endpoint, I expect uh, 200 OK with this content type header and this body. And this is a runnable test. Um, but then on the other hand, I'm building a, a networking peer-to-peer -peer client library for game developers in the browser. And there, I write in the same language. Um, I have the back, backend is running. Given the player green connects, creates a network for a specific game, uh, and they will receive a network event ready, and they will receive a new peer ID, this peer ID. Has nothing to do with APIs, but it's a runnable test for me, and it reads very naturally. And as we all know, reading is more important than writing, because you only write once, and you read more times. Um, so you can use it for a lot of more things than just testing your APIs. Um, you've seen a couple of examples, and there are a couple of keywords noted in red, magenta. Uh, there's it always starts with a feature. You're describing a feature with a title and an optional description. Uh, that really helps with the documentation part of it. Um, and then in a feature, there are one or more scenarios. And you can have zero, but that doesn't make any sense. Um, you can also have a background, which I'll give some examples later. If all your scenarios have the same preface, the same users needed, you put it in the background, and you don't have to repeat yourself all the time. And then there are a number of given, a number of when, and a number of then steps. Given gives a background, a state. When is something happening, and then is what you expect, or what's going to happen. And with and, 
you can read it more easily. It reads more nicely. Um, and then the rest is regular expression in English. OK. Now, let's talk about APIs for a second. Okay. Quick drink. Because there are multiple ways to test your APIs. Maybe the simplest is just to test it using Go unit tests. Um, this, this is the smallest I could get it. Is you create a request and then uh, a recorder, um, a response recorder. You create your mock store and maybe a client, a mock client to Cloudflare if you use it. You add some users to your mock store and you initiate, in, instantiate your handler that you want to test. You run the handler and then you check the response recording if the if the body is correct and you can do whatever you want in your testing suite <coughs> this is how a go test looks like makes sense right problem is for me it's one a lot of writing and it doesn't read very nicely my uh, javascript typescript front end team doesn't yeah i can guess what it does but it doesn't read naturally for them um, and also if i replace certain parts with helper function, it reads even less nice because I hide code away and unless I name my helper functions all very verbosely, which is basically what Cucumber does. Um, so I have some problems with this. I hope you agree. Um, one big advantage here is it's very easy to inject code. Just, I can code some here, change some data. That is very easy. Um, you can do a similar thing but using, an API, using a library that helps you. I found uh, API test. This is basically the kind thing, same thing. You have a handler, and then you, in this case, you chain some functions to do your test. In this case, you give it the handler, then you get the message, and then with an expect helper, you say, I want this body and this status code. And, and I'm sure that will give a nice error if you fail, or if you, if you give a different body. Um, a lot less writing, but I don't know exactly what's happening, and still, um, not very clear for my front-enders maybe to use. And it's also, if my handler's not existing yet, I get compiler errors before I'm done with everything. I could also write it in Cucumber and then it looks like this. This is a more bigger example. I have a bunch of state, two given steps. One that creates two teams in my database. The one uh, that creates three users. I purposely also created a user in another team because I don't want to get that in this test. Um, in our case, our step definitions that create teams and users, they connect to an actual database and create them. So I also test the logic in our queries because I run it against my actual database. Then it reads, uh, the client does a get request to this endpoint, uh, expect the 200 OK and this content type, and this is the data I then get. If I were to make a mistake in my query that returns all users instead of just from the team, I would have gotten an extra user and my test would fail. Um, plus, can we agree that this reads pretty easily? Even if you're not a Go developer or maybe if you're a front-end developer, almost documentation, um, which for us it is. Like I send this to my front and my front-ender nowhere to find the feature test to see how does this endpoint work again, looks it up. Um, yes. Now, I hope most of you are now wondering, but then you have to write these step definitions for all of these things. I see some nodding hats, uh, which is true. Um, but you do that only once. And in my day-to-day -day work, the last four years, it happens once a month I touch a step definition, let alone writing a complete new one. Uh, sometimes I have to add an extra case that I maybe want to transpose something or I add something very specific because it reads nicely, but I rarely write new step definitions. Um, in the beginning, it's a little bit more upfront work, for sure. Um, this is a very big example. I'll go through it quickly. Um, we have a surface for our game developers to store user data. Imagine having a level editor and they don't have to make a backend, they can use our backend. It's basically a JSON store, and you get a code back, which has a voting function where you can upvote, but you can only upvote once a day as a user. Um, I have, a, in the background, 
I create a bunch of user data because I use the same data to, in all of the tests. Then one of the features is you vote on a level. I have some extra background because it's important what time of day it is because you can only vote once a day. So I mark the time in my test and the user's IP address. Then when the client does a post request to this endpoint, and it also says which key, I expect the body to be to give a 200, and it should give me the next JSON blob, which the developers can use to make their client, their games, they know what to expect. And then the next tests are more for me. I also check if the database state is correct after this happening. So when this has happened, the upvotes should have gone to 33. And if we look up in the, um, in the background, it's 32 in the beginning. Also where it re returns, it's 33. And I know in the database it's recorded as well. And I, for me, it was important that the revision didn't increase. We just do an upvote. So I also check that stays one. And I also record in the votes table, I record a vote for this user with the correct IP address. And now the next scenario would be the user trying to vote again and getting a, I think it's a 400 uh, bad request or no, it's a, it's a forbidden, I think. And then I make sure this is already in the database, calls the same thing, it can't anymore. Um, still pretty large test, but it still reads very easy. And our game developers who have nothing to do with backend engineering or Golang or Rust, they use this to make their clients basically. Um, yes. Step definitions. Let's look up some real world examples because I only showed a cucumber example. Uh, this is the smallest I could find in my own code base. This is the step where I check the status code is correct, basically. The regular expression is fairly straightforward. G um, given the response code, should, uh, then the, res code, the response code should be a number, which is a regular expression. And then in parentheses, OK, I kind of just ignore. <laughs> I don't care about it too much. Um, and of course, this function, which on the struct has a recorded response, because you've done a, a step definition that did the request earlier. If not, uh, that's just a programming mistake, and I give an error. And then I compare the recorded response code with the status code you put in the step definition. And if it's not the same, I return an error. And in this case, I also read the body because it's nice. I get a 400. OK, why? I expected an OK, and I get the body with the error code in there as well, just to help myself. Um, and then I have one more bigger step definition, which is setting up the database. Um, and in our test suites, what we do when we start the suite, I spin up a Docker con it spins up a Docker container with Postgres. And it does the, uh, the migration files it applies, so everything is set up. And after each scenario, it flushes the entire database for the next. Or in another project, we just spin up a new container for every scenario, because it's fast enough. And we didn't want to deal with, uh, we want to paralyze the test. And in this, in this project, it was not paralyzed. Um, so given these blah records, I made it very generic, so with this step, I can fill any table in my database. <laughs> then the library that does Cucumber for me, GoDog, handles parsing the table for me. I just get a table, uh, which I can iterate through. What I do is I extract the header one, the header line that says all the database fields. And then I, it's a test, so I can hackily construct my, my SQL. And then for each row, I insert it into the database. And it connects to the database. So if my code uses a complex query, I also test that logic. Okay, too much code. Let's continue. OK, why would you want to do this? It sounds like a lot of work, uh, which is kind of true up front, but which is kind of true for testing in general. If you have never done test-driven development, it sounds like a lot of work. And it is in the beginning, because you're not very versed with it. But when you're, when you're comfortable with it, writing with Unit test actually makes you code faster because you can quicker test your code. You don't break as often as much. The same thing is true here. It's a little bit more work up front, um, but I go way faster having this right now. And I can copy all the step definitions to a new project if I need to. Okay, I have a list of pros. 
and a list of cons. And if you find more pros or more cons, let me know. Uh, this is the list. I'll have one slide for each one of them to go through quickly. Um, first up, everyone can read these tests. You've seen them. They're just English. Um, for us, it serves as documentation. And more powerfully, I write such a feature test before I start making a feature or a new endpoint. And then I make a pull request. I send it to my team and my front-enders, and we talk about it. Is this what my product manager meant? Yes, OK. My uh, back-end engineer can say, well, is it smart to return this in JSON? It's, such it's a lot of data. Can we make it maybe CSV? My front-ender can say, can you make it into strings so I, can con I don't have to convert them? We can talk about the feature. And I haven't even started coding yet. I've written some English text, basically. And then when we're all happy, we want this feature, I have my test ready, and I can start coding. And I have the documentation already for free. Um, it's easier to write upfront tests because you don't have any compiler errors. If you write unit tests of a function you haven't created yet, you can't autocomplete it, et cetera. Um, and this is what I said in the previous slide. I even make a pull request with just a new test. All this showed in a demo as well. Um, Cucumber is reusable, cross-project, cross-language. Uh, I learned this in a Ruby environment, but the skill Cucumber stayed with me in every language. Um, as I said in my example, I we ported like a search bit to another language. We had the same test suite. Um, and in the networking library example, we use the JavaScript to run the test. We kind of want to try running it from a Go perspective, so I have more control on the back end. And then within Go, I'll spin up a browser to test the JavaScript end of things. But then I don't have to change my test suite, because it's just Cucumber. I can reuse it. Um, and we have one testing syntax for multiple projects in our organization, which is nice. Uh, this is my tagline always. I have 100% test coverage of my documented features because my tests are my documentation. So if it's in the documentation, I'm not going to break it because uh, it's a test. And if something is broken, I didn't document that bit of behavior, apparently. That's also on me, of course. I can write a, a regression test and fix it. And then that will stay fixed, of course. Um, and ha having a, like a weird state in a database that breaks our application, it's super easy in a, in, for me to copy, make a new file with a regression name create some tables, some records in a database to set up this weird situation we have in production. And then I see it failing in the same way as on production. And then I can fix it. And I have my regression test ready. Super nice. And then it's part of the 100% test coverage. This is why I'm, as a developer, happy with it. It's fast. Having 100% coverage, I don't run. I have never go run my backend locally to test it with curl or with the front end. I haven't done that in a very long time. I only run the Cucumber test of the feature I'm working on. CI runs the entire suite. And then, of course, after approval of one of my colleagues, uh, we merge to main, and uh, continuous deployment slaps it to production immediately, so confident we are in our test suite right now, which makes us make changes really fast. I don't have to run and, and recreate users to test with, because it's all part of the scenario. Um, it's super easy for me to run just one test, and, and then CI runs the entire thing. Like, I don't want to make backends without this anymore. Um, there are some downsides, obviously. I'm not lying to you. Um, I've listed four. Um, I'm sure people can find more, but I, these, I think, is I have some problems with. First up, I already talked about it much. There's some upfront work. You need to write step definitions for everything. You can just write some inline code. Um, that's definitely more work. Like imagine writing unit tests, but you can only use helper functions in your test itself. That's how it feels a little bit. But as I said, I rarely touch these step definitions once a month tops. Um, and new projects, I copy paste most of them. Um, there is some performance overhead. I think if you would write all of our feature tests in Go tests, with my first just 
written out example, it would definitely run faster. Uh, the runner needs to parse these, uh, these features and then run them. It's definitely a little slower. It's still pretty fast. Um, uh, I'm almost never waiting on them. If I run just one test, it's like a couple of seconds. Um, but it's definitely a little slower. It's a new scale. You have to learn it. True for every new thing. That's not very specific to Cucumber, but I added it anyway. Uh, also, your, your team needs to learn this. Debugging, like I really like in a unit test that you should play, press play on the test and you have a breakpoint in your code. That's not as out of the box right now. I'm working on it. I have a VS Code integration built, but it's not published yet, where I can click run in my editor to run one feature and it hits breakpoints, but that's not public yet. You can run them also manually using Delve to debug them, but definitely in VS Code, it's not as nicely integrated as Unis test. That's definitely uh, one of the things I'm trying to fix as soon as possible. Um, let's pray to the demo gods. I have an example to give you guys to, to give a feel how this impacts my day-to-day -day work. Um, yes, let's um, tap back to an editor. Can we read this in the back? Perfect. We have a service for our devel game developers to store JSON, get a code back, and share them via URL. It's a pretty basic service because it's perfect for this example. It's also a very early project. You can see on the limited readme, it just says read the feature test for now, <laughs> um, which is nice because th those are very readable. And the few developers that have worked with as an, as an alpha, they've worked off the feature tests, basically, as a documentation. And I didn't get any complaints. Um, I'll show you how the service work real quick. A game needs to exist for Pokey. I didn't make it as JSON store, because then we'll definitely get um, some abuse. So a game needs to exist uh, within. That's always just a UUID. If a client then posts to this game with an arbitrary type name. In this example, I'm doing levels, but it could be a leaderboard or you share uh, a high score or whatever. With the following data, arbitrary data, I, have, I made something up that looks like game data. And a couple of key value pairs that you can later use in querying the top fields or the top levels. Then I expect the 201 created and the following response, which is Again, just JSON, you get a random ID and a secret, which the user that created the level can use to edit it later. And then it's added to the database, and there's an access log to record when it was last accessed. That's basically how the service works. Do you guys have a good feeling what kind of service this is right now? You read one of my tests, and you know what kind of service it is. That's super nice. Um, I can also show you how it is for me to run these tests. I will cd into the feature folder, test. I go test. Oh. I'll mark it verbose so you can see them going around. This now spins up a Docker container, it compiles the thing, it parses the feature files, and it runs. And it's done. It did uh, 36 of these features, of uh, scenarios, uh, 200 steps. In 2.4 seconds, and the total time was 3.8 seconds, which was spinning up the database in Docker and doing the uh, migration files. First time you have to pull the Docker, I already did, so that's, um, and it's super easy. If I want to just run one file or one test, I can just only run all the error messages, just give it a file, and I can test it. Okay, my developers are happy with this, and but they want to get some stats. I want to know how many levels are there, for example, of my game. And my product manager says, build it. Uh, when is it finished? I'll say it's finished in a day, because I'm fast. I don't know. Um, I'm going to add a new feature. What I'll do, I'll create a new feature file, call it stats. What I always do, I almost never type. I give a feature name, uh, stats about uh, games type, then I can add some longer description, which I'm going to omit. And then I'll 
I know I need a couple of data, so I'll just copy it from this feature. Now I can get some stats on these things. Uh, stats are going to be an, uh, a get. I can also copy that from a feature. Um, let's copy it until here. The only difference is I'm going to make up a magic underscore stats endpoint that will return the stats for this uh, level, uh, this type of, for this game. That should return a 200, and it should the data. I'll make it up. Stats. Uh, total is three. Because if you look at my data, for this game, there are three levels. There's also a profile, which it should not count, and levels for another game, which it also should not count. I've written a test for a feature that doesn't exist. I can now make, this is too small. If it was a bigger feature, I could make a pull request, send it to my team. My backender would say, this is not very forward compatible. Make an object that says stats. Then later we can add metadata or something. So we are not colliding in keys anymore. And I didn't have to change any code after the fact because I haven't started coding yet. Um, maybe my front ender says, can you make it a string? Because um, better for me or not, I don't expect him to. We can talk about it and when we're happy, I can start implementing. I can already test it now. It will most likely go wrong. Database, yes. The underscore stats is not a valid ID because this, this endpoint doesn't exist in my code yet. Now I can start implementing. And I'm gonna cheat because I already did it and I put it in the git stash. I'll run through the changes. I added a st an extra function in my store to get the stats at a very difficult query. I added an endpoint, underscore stats, in my mux, in my router, using G in this, uh, in this application. And a new endpoint um, here. And there's a new response object that says stats. And I can see if it now works. And it calls to the new store function. OK, let's see if it works. I already secretly know it's not going to, because I made some mistakes. I get a nice diff. There's something wrong. I get five. Uh, I get five levels instead of three. I made a mistake. I definitely made a mistake. Um, what did I do wrong? Somebody sees it already? Any S uh, SQL ex uh, experts? Oh. I did an or instead of an and. Stupid mistake. Where the game is this game and the type is this type. Otherwise, it finds too many things. OK, made a change. Save it. Run it again. Still something wrong. Right, capital T. I forgot the JSON annotation. My bad. Luckily, we have um, GitHub Copilot. Okay, let's try it again. Now it succeeds. Maybe I broke something somewhere else. Let's run the, my entire documented features list. CI also does this, of course. I didn't break anything. Now I make my pull request with the implementation. My backenders look at it. Maybe you have a security officer that looks at it. And then we, sh and we ship to production after this. And adding a field is just as easy as adding a field here, maybe latest created at, when was the latest level added or something. Depends on what my developers need or our developers. And uh, maybe I add some other examples, like what happens if, there's no, if the game doesn't exist. Like should it say total zero or should it give a 404? I'm actually not sure what it does now. So my, my backend teammate could say, could you add another test to see what happens if the game doesn't exist? Just to give a random UUID, also change the type to high scores. And let's say I want the 404. Can test this button. 
this is a plugin I made myself, it's very slow. <laughs> That's the biggest problem right now. Uh, what is cool is that it does a debug run. I can put um, uh, breakpoints in my code right now. And indeed, if, if you can see, I get, a, I get a 200 and total is zero. This is not what we want. I need to go in and fix this. Um, we could, but it's kind of boring for you to watch. Uh, and it's not an actual feature we need, so it's a waste of everybody's time. But in this case, I could add some more examples. What if you're not logged in? What if, what if, what if, what if? You, as many examples if you want. Okay. I have two more slides, and then we're ready for questions. I have some tips, which some of them are generally for testing or coding. Isolate your tests is always true, also in Cucumber. You want, I also always run them in random order, so I'm sure they don't affect each other in some way. Um, make sure they don't never affect each other. I'd like to say generalize your step definitions. Don't make a step definition specifically for users. I make a step definition to add stuff to the database. But also allow for a very specific step for readability. If you very often create a logged in paying user with a bunch of steps, that can be one step. Like given uh, the, the user Kun is created and has, is, has a paying subscription, can be one step to make it read more easy, for example. And that step could call, subs could, could call, could call other steps that does the actual creating a user and giving it a subscription. Write these tests for the reader. I think that's the reason I fell in love with Go, is you write code for the reader, for your reviewer, for your future self. Uh, same for testing, and especially in Cucumber, because uh, it's also used as documentation. And I learned, I used to mock everything. I learned if you can use the actual dependencies, especially if they contain business logic. As you see, my test suite spins up the database, so I can test if they make a mistake in my OR query just now. If I would have mocked that store, like in another interface, I could have, but that would have just returned the correct value, and then I wouldn't have catched my SQL error. Um, but also don't, if there's no, if you're just a key value store for caching, you can do that in memory, that's fine. Um, yes. Some closing notes. We at Pokey and my previous company where I learned about this are super happy with this feature test. It's Super co There's one project that doesn't have this, and we're always fighting who, who needs to write in that old project. Um, it's super useful for regression tests, for red-green tests, as you just saw. It helps us in communication a lot. Some of the tests I even send to my uh, product designer. Is this what you meant? Is this the behavior you expected? Uh, especially about our um, invoices that are being generated. Um, this is not the answer for everything. We still have a bunch of unit tests in our projects, especially for a lot of edge cases in like smaller functions. It's annoying to write for like 16 different values of a convert string function to write feature tests for that. We also write unit tests. Um, and as you hopefully just saw, it saves us a lot of time developing and we rarely have any issues in production. I don't, we don't even run a page duty roster. If something breaks, doesn't, we'll, we'll hear about it the next morning. But then again, we're not making hospital software. We're making video game software, so it's a little less. Um... OK. Um, I hope it was entertaining, interesting, and I hope some of you will use this in the future. Uh, thank you for your time. Any questions? Thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah, that was great. I wanted to ask: Is there a good way to test like the step functions that you write? Because those look like they're pretty complicated, and yes. if there's like a good way to do that. Um, so I don't test my step functions because I'm lazy, and again, I'm not making hospital software. Uh, um, I did thought did, uh, think about it, and I think you can very easily make a, a unit test for your step definition if you wanted to. I'm sure there. Are, there's a way to just call them and see if they give the correct error, giving the correct input. Um, where's the, the, this one? I create, can create a unit test that makes sure a recorded response is like a certain way and then call this method 
with a certain number and then test that basically. So you definitely can make unit tests to test these step definitions. Yes. Yeah, I, I think for this one, but I think also like some of the ones where you have like database assertion and stuff um, seem like they could be like maybe a yeah. little bit more yeah. difficult to do so. Yeah, definitely true. But that's yeah. true for making tests for databases in for any sure. case. Yeah. It, and yeah. Is there like boilerplate step functions like for the database insertion that we can access? Because rewriting them from scratch seems yes. like be difficult. <laughs> uh, there is for Ruby and Python. Uh -huh. I don't know of any good one for Go. Uh, and I am always convincing my product manager for me to have some time to make them because um, we have them internally. I'm also fighting to make that uh, data project open source and then you can rip them from there, but not yet. Uh, Ask my product manager, please. OK, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, Appreciate thanks. it. Sorry. Thanks for the talk. Cheers. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, how do you test third party APIs? Third party APIs. And how complex can these step functions get? Okay, uh, how to test third-party APIs? I think you will run into the same issues with any testing framework. And for us, the answer is depends on what type of uh, third-party request it is. We do a couple of things. One is I have in a project just a step definition that says, given this external URL returns this JSON, and then I have a mock server that returns that. And it reads very nicely because it's also about another service in our, in our system and you know, oh, if the, this other server returns this, this will happen in this server. And it reads very nice. And another part, which is about payments to the API of TransferWise, I use the VCR technology, where I, when writing these tests, I have a sandbox API key and I actually connect to WISE. But these, re these communication is recorded and stored on disk, and when it's run on, on CI, it uses these recording to replay these communications. But same, same problem with unit tests. Your second question, how complex can be, they be? They are just a regular expression method with code, as complex as you can make them. Um, yeah, it's up to you, and that's true for any code. Like, keep it readable, keep them short. You can reuse code, you can have helper function in these methods, you can engineer them as good as you can, and they're a little less important because they're part of your test suite. But yeah, as complicated as you wanted them to be. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so one question. So I'm wondering so how I can integrate this to our existing app, uh, applications. So if I already have like a huge, uh, let's say, code base and I have a huge API, uh, it would be helpful if we have, for example, step functions that are already uh, like in a one package that I can yeah. use, for example, in for HTTP requests, like whatever you test, you would yeah. have a URL. So do we have any kind of uh, already? public package that we can use? No, no, that is, um, I'm working on it, okay. not yet. Um, we've done it now a couple of times in a couple of different repositories, and I've approached it at different times a couple of times, and now I'm kind of dialing down of the nice way to do it and make a, make a package that I can reuse, um, like a design, and now I still have to package it and make it reusable. Um, maybe they exist, but I didn't find it. And they do exist if you're using Ruby or Python, um, maybe in Rust even as well. So it is a thing in Ruby and in this sphere to public, make these things public, but I haven't found them for Go yet. Uh, one more question. Yeah. So you said you have the 100% uh, test coverage, but for one project in your company, you do not use this yet. Yeah. Uh, so do you skip the QA process for both projects or only for the one that has 100% uh, code coverage? No, we skip the, we go to production also for that other project okay. um, because, we're, uh, because we want to go fast. Okay. Um, and that ASA project that breaks every now and then, but it's a little less important and it doesn't block users immediately. Um, and that's a project that uh, often my colleagues, because I say, well, then make some feature tests for that at no time. Uh, they test it manually with Curl and they run their front end on their computers as well to test it thoroughly. And we rarely make changes to it because it's a legacy project. Yeah. Thank you. 
you mentioned that uh, when you ran the test, you just ran go test. Yeah. But you were mentioning that there is some Docker builds or how does it happen? What does Go actually do and what does Docker do? I'll show you real quick. Um, in my features folder, I have one features underscore test dot go, which has a test main. And this does the setup. This is run when I do go test. This is where I call the go doc library to do his thing. I set up my step definitions as I have an HTTP step definition that has a private key for authentication, I think. Um, I have a database steps. And then here you have the hooks that initialize stuff before every scenario, after every scenario, you can add some hooks where I reset the, um, the database, for example. And if you go to the database steps, there I have a, it's called on initialize suite. I use Docker tests from Ori, which is, you can also use a unit test and it works really fast where I can just say, I need a Postgres container with this, uh, this Docker settings, remove it automatically, expire it after a couple of seconds, connect to it, it's just some bootstrap. And uh, at what part then does your test do the Cucumber files? That's part of the GoDoc library and that's after these, I think it does the parsing before the test suite is initialized. If I make an error or something syntactically, it doesn't have to boot up the database. But, and then it has all the scenarios in memory. And then after all this initialization, initialization steps, it will just loop through. I read the code. They'll loop through all the scenarios and execute them, basically. Okay, so it's up to GoDoc to do the actual yeah. Cucumber test. Yeah. And it's us to set it up in the main function like we would usually do for unit tests. Yeah. Okay, and one minor question. I saw when you do steps definition, um, you do some uh, grouping or matching in uh, regex. Uh, does it implicitly uh, match the uh, number of arguments in your regex to the one function step? Uh, and does it do it maybe like, does it just go in order? Yeah. Yeah, so just, yeah. This depends on the library you're using. And in this case, it's just the first argument. The first argument, in my case, always the context. Uh, and then it just go next. And then the last one is usually the body. Some of the step definitions have a body or a table, and that's in the last argument. And there's also, I, I rarely use it, a syntax for the step definition where you don't use regular expression, you just say word, and then it knows there needs to be a word there, or int. Uh, that's cucumber syntax. Cool, and maybe the last one would be, um, what would be about some like, this I would say replaces unit tests, Okay, maybe with actually yeah, with database there, but how would you say like end-to-end -end tests? Yes. Is uh, there an option for that with Cucumber? Cucumber is originally also designed for end-to-end -end tests. A lot of companies using it, they spin up a browser, they spin up their backends, and their scenarios, like user goes to this page, clicks on that button, are written in Cucumber. And then these steps run the, the Chrome, headless Chrome, and they do the things. Um, I call this feature tests. And they're a little bit in between integration tests and unit tests. They, they let the boundary of a surface, uh, they test basically. And for our company, that's enough. We don't have integration tests. Yeah. yeah. What other questions do you have? <laughs> One more there. So thank you very much, first of all. Uh, let's say you have a use case that mm -hmm. is served through different uh, protocols, or yeah. let's say GraphQL and REST APIs. Yeah. Do you duplicate the same um, rules or scenarios, or do you have a way to, let's say, avoid duplication? Yeah. Um, I can say two things about this. Let's say you have an other accept header, and then it does maybe YAML. I can make a test for this. I would say that's not really business logic. Like it's just another way of representing it. I would omit it, maybe put it in some documentation. There is a way where you, and I rarely use it, where you do a scenario outline and you can use some, um, some uh, substitutions and then below you'll have an example list. Oh. Come on. Where you do all your types. So you don't have to copy-paste the entire thing. Um, I also don't shy away of copy-pasting the whole thing. 
because um, these file names, these files tend to be a little longer than maybe code, but there are also a lot of white space. Um, so yes, and it depends. Thank you. Yes. What other questions do you have? Okay. No? Well, thanks again. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>